A while ago, I picked up a couple of these on eBay. Uh, these are CH340C. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you to my Patreons and all my subscribers. Thank you very much. So, the CH340. This is a USB serial adapter chip. You're probably familiar with things like the FTDI serial adapter chips, but this is a lower price alternative. In a lot of applications, if you just want a simple three-wire serial interface, you don't really care what kind of chip you use, as long as it's inexpensive and easy to handle. Now, this particular chip is an SOIC package, which means the pins are bigger and further apart and easier to solder, is my point, than are the pins on a TSOP that I have used before from FTDI. So I thought I'd rig up a quick test setup and see how this works. And here's the uh, data sheet for the CH340. I think I got this off the SparkFun website, but they're floating around the internet. Gives you the usual marketing stuff and gives you your pinouts of the various types of chips. I have the, uh, the 340C, okay? Then they give you the definition of all these pins and what they're all for, whether it's the SOP 20, 16, or the 10, why they didn't just give you the pins for the C and the B, and so I, I, maybe they felt they saved paper, or in this case, electrons, I don't know. Uh, but you got to be careful how you read this thing. Uh, supply a point one decoupling on uh, the V3 pin, which we did. Which we will have to do. Uh, what do we got going on up here? The power also wants a point one. There is no oscill there is no crystal for the C version, so you no know, connection. Blah blah blah. This is a, the crystal uh, oscillator output. We don't have that. Your plus and minus for the D USB. Forbid device suspending. Well, we don't have that on our chip. <laughs> okay. So what does that mean? It means that we cannot suspend the CH340, I think, which is fine for the apps that I'm thinking about using. There's a transmit and receive data. The usual things for the RS-232 lines, clear to send. A liaison input signal, active low. Now, unfortunately, in this data sheet, it doesn't actually say what this does, what it means, whether you can use it with hardware flow control or not. This, I don't know. And there's where you get what you pay for. Honestly, I don't know if the FTDI sheets and the prolifics talk much about it either. If you really want rock-solid hardware flow control, you'll either have to analyze the, the chip for your purposes and the situation you're going to use it or put blind faith, which is what you're going to have to do anyway because there could always be some sort of a firmware or a model revision, you know, sub-point release where they change something and things could break. You know, that I it drives you nuts. If you need to know if it has to be exactly what you want, you're going to have to do much more research or build your own, which I'm always up for that, of course, but uh, that can take more effort. The usual data set ready, ring indicator, DCD, DTR, RTS. So the other flow control signal, if you want to use that, and it doesn't say much more than this, uh, other than this is the output. So meh, I don't know. I suspect that the operating system drivers are going to have to turn this on and off under software control to emulate hardware flow control if it is needed. Now, of course, the beauty is that, you know, in modern PCs and operating systems, Linux, Windows, Mac, OS, and stuff like that, or OS X, whatever they call it today, will have enormous buffers on their side of things. It's the embedded devices that I have more uh, concern about on the other end, right? So if we put this CH340 in a little embedded device and we don't have a lot of buffering in there and the device says, okay, I'm not, uh, I'm not ready, and uh, the CTS says it's not clear when you, um, you know, the mirror image of that, right? So the reaction time of the UART, that's in the CH340 is unknown 
if I if I uh, raise this, I enable or disable, I should say, this signal here. How long will it take the chip to stop transmitting? And that's kind of important with older retro projects like the kind that I like to work on. <laughs> okay, so we'll find out soon enough whether that thing's reliable. Uh, what else do we got? Here's the RS232 pin on the C. It's an assistant enable active high with a pull down. So arguably it is currently disabled. Unless I pull that up, I don't know. Unless the signal means disable when it is active. I don't know. We'll have to run some experiments and see what this thing does, if anything, that we can note. I'm going to also Google around uh, and see schematics that other people have made, uh, devices that they've done some presumably thought about it themselves, and maybe benefit from their effort as well. Here's the schematic, for example, from SparkFun. These guys are pretty cool. They have a little breakout board with a 340C on it. And uh, what, what did they do? <laughs> they got a little voltage regulator so you can use this on your projects. They have uh, a header on it that r pins out these signals here, which I'd use it in my cases, except for the fact that they got CTS and DTR. This probably matches some other board that they have. And, of course, if you look over here, they don't even bother connecting up any of the other pins on the CH340. And they left it float. Uh, come over here because of the RS-232 pin. So leaving that float might be what we want to do. So, yeah, they don't have RTS, DCD ring indicator, and DSR pinned out at all. What else have they got on here that we might benefit from? They got a bypass smaller than I have. Point oh one for whatever reason. Maybe they analyzed it and found this work better or not. You never really know why anyone does anything. You know, I got a lot of students and, and I tell them, and oh, you know, I don't have to document my code. It's self-explanatory. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, add one to variable named X is really obvious. Yes. If that's what your doc says, then yes, I agree. It's worthless. However, if you tell me why it's important to add one or whatever you're doing in there, why I might care or what I might use it for, that's what documentation is for. So it'll be real interesting to see if there was a note somewhere uh, that stated, we chose this in spite of being told to do otherwise right here in the actual data sheet uh, because of why. All right. Okay, Spark Fun. <laughs> Anyone care to chime in? <laughs> in any event, uh, it probably runs okay if we leave this floating. And uh, we'll figure out through uh, trial and error <laughs> exactly what the heck is going on if it acts strange when we play around with it. All right. So, and that's pretty much everything. I guess they got a version that does infrared if we really wanted to have an infrared. Uh, interface on USB, okay? Well, these newer uh, USB uh, adapter chips, interface chips, are uh, neat. The older ones used to require, uh, like, series resistors on the USB signals and, you know, capacitors and things like that on there. And while they don't really cost anything and they can be very tiny, uh, when you're building your own boards and stuff, it's annoying to have four extra parts between the USB connector and the chip. So kudos to everybody. Uh, I mean, 10 years ago, we had all those extra parts to condition the signal on the plus and minus lines before they went into the uh, chips. Also, 10, 15 years ago, we had to have external crystals and, and all kinds of extra. And then, you, of course, you have to have the, the, uh, the, the, the capacitors. And then, of course, along with the load capacitors and everything else, I, I thank you again, right? We don't need the crystals anymore. And FTDI does the same thing. And I believe Prolific does as well. So, I mean, this is across the board. Thank you to everybody that's been doing this these days. 
which they comment on right here. So what are the differences? Some chips have a little double E prompts. You can put config data in there. Other ones don't. And why do I want this chip versus another one? These are the, uh, obviously, the configurations for the B, which I don't have. It'll run on 5 or 3.3. Oh, I just noticed this right now. When using 5-volt source, which we are, the VCC pin, 5 volts, and power uh, input 5 volt power and the 3 pin should connect with decoupling 0.1 microfarad capacitor. I don't know why I would need to decouple the 5 and the 3 together, which, if we take these words literally, that's what it suggests. Uh, I suspect. What they should have said is that when you're using 5-volt power, the 5-volt should be decoupled independently of the 3, which matches their own schematics, as well as the one we just saw from SparkFun. When I'm on 3.3 alone, connect 3 with VCC and put 3.3 on both of them. And the other circuit voltage, which connected with this, cannot exceed 3.3, which is typical. Although, somebody should rewrite this thing. <laughs> but you know what? I laugh, but for a couple of years after these things came out, there were no English translations. This is infinitely better than nothing at all. So uh, I'm laughing, but I'm like, can somebody put... You know, a dollar fifty into improving this, please, uh, would be nice. And by that, I mean the manufacturer, so that they can verify the words are right. Of course, if this is the best they can do, eh, okay. Mo moving on. And here they talk about the uh, auto power suspend. Of course, we don't have NOS on the C, so I'm not sure what that really means. And I'm still not entirely sure what the RS-232 thing is all about. DTR is used as a config pin before it's complete. If I put a 4.7 pull down, I generate the default low level during the USB enumeration and apply larger current to the USB bus which was nice. Is this for the B? It says in general, but we're underneath a heading that talks about the B. Oh, there is no heading. They're just randomly talking about either a specific chip or all the chips. I don't know. And if they're messing around with DTR during configuration, how the heck? What if it's plugged into an RS-232 device when you power it on and it's yanking this thing around? Yeah, maybe this is a suggestion that we don't want to use DTR in our designs for anything. So what, what do we have here? Hmm. <laughs> the one pin they do use, and it's this one. Wow. Maybe they did that on purpose so that they can play around with the power configs or something. I suspect not. I wonder if anybody's having weird problems with this thing because they didn't read that sentence. Hmm. In UART mode, it contains these pins. Data transfer modem liaison and assistant. Okay. Not that the words liaison and assistant are used in any other data sheet I've ever seen in the English language. I'm sure there is somewhere, but not the ones that I remember reading at this moment. Blah, 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 and keeps high when reception is idle. This obviously is a suggestion to us. That doesn't drive it high. We need to keep it high when it is. That's, what, that's the normal RS-232 type of thing. If it's driven high, assistant function will be enabled and internal inverter will automatically insert to the RXD. Oh, that'll just okay. So if I if I drive two thirty two high, 
then I suspect this means that the outputs will be enabled and an inverter will invert the received data. When it's low, which is the default, period. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody write this thing. Data transfer for pins. RxD keeps high when you are at reception is idle. In other words, I need to do that. Okay. For those chips, of which includes us, if this is driven high, assistant function will be enabled, whatever that is. Like I think that's the output pins that would have the RS232 signals, but I'm not entirely sure. We'll have to see if that's referenced anywhere else. An inverter flips the RxD pin, comma, and the pin becomes low by default. What pin? Uh, I think that's the RS-232 pin. When UART is idle, transmit data pin is high. While that keeps low. I think, that yeah, this chip has like an inverted transmit data line or something. Wow. Okay. I think this means we leave it alone and it works. As also quasi confirmed by the SparkFun drawing. Liaison. Ha ha! It's CTS DSR RID. All these modem liaison signals are controlled and function defined by computer applications. In other words, I suspect hardware flow control is not even on the cards here, and we have to have a driver that notices the changes on the input, uh, you know, like clear to send and stuff like that, and then tell it to stop sending and so on. So who knows how many bytes will flow out of this thing after somebody says it's not clear to send. We could run some experiments and find that out. Assistant pins. Aha! Liaison. Well, these are ins and out. I was about to say maybe those are the inputs and the other ones are outputs. I, I don't know. Assistant pins contain IR-232. T now. It look, okay, so the assistant pins are like the control configuration of the chip, like this RS-232 pin. We don't have any of the other ones on here on our C suffix chip. The liaison are the I.O. pins for the, these are, these are this RS-232 signal pins. IR does this. If pin is used to control assistant. Which we don't have the IR version. If 232 driven high. This will be reversed. This is what said above. Act pin, which we don't have. T now pin uh, is actually like another label of the 232 pin, but it's a different mode. This is a different chip. In 45, the other half duplex mode. T now could be used to indicate transmit receive status and so on. Blah, blah, blah. Built-in separate transmit receive buffer and support simplex, half dupe, full duplex. Serial data contains one low-level start bit and then this other stuff. It supports common baud rates, etc. <laughs> oh! Oh, that's, that's, there you go. That's a specification, if I ever saw one. Baud rate error allows no less than 2%. I'm laughing, by the way, because I wonder if it does 250k baud. I don't know. Because if it does, you can easily set up and build yourself a nice DMX bus driver with it In windows the driver can emulate a standard serial port mostly original apps are totally totally compatible without any modification 340 can be used to upgrade some stuff yes 
Minus 40 to 85, no problem. That's really uncomfortable in either one of those. <laughs> if you've ever been in an environment where that's true, uh, and I have, by the way, <laughs> this is very cold. Uh, okay. Give us the usual voltages and stuff like that. And it says if you, if you connect these two together on this pin, run it at 3.3. Otherwise, you get the separate ones. Separate power. Okay. Current 20 milliamps. Okay. If you got a chip that needs a crystal, run it at 12. There's the T with the crystal. There's the B. Now, if you go through, you know, I mean, we're almost done with the schematic here or the diagram anyway. The scroll bar is way down there. The rest of this is infrared and all that or some other examples of different chips. The C and the B use the same example. Talks about here, this is the T, the B, or the C. And this is what we're looking at here uh, in terms of evaluating this thing so they show restart or reset which we don't have I don't think on a C and they don't show the RS-232 pin on here at all hmm Transmit data and public ground need connected. Hmm. The other signal line should suspend when not in use. Whatever that means. I suspect I mean tri-state. Or be pulled to ground. Maybe that's what they meant. I don't know. Uh, P2 is that thing, yes. Besser on V3 is 0.1. Besser on C9 is 0.1. 8, 9. Okay, Spark Fun, how come you decided to use a different one there? If you got a crystal, do this. Not required. Pay attention to decoupling. Make sure you don't route wires all over the place and be a total slob. Got it. Here's a through wire if you're going to use the T with the crystal. There's another T with a hack driver with discrete transistors and things like that. That's kind of neat. Oh, they, they do make a little charge pump or something down here. Whatever, we don't have that chip, so that's not an option for us right now. Anyway, I don't think I'm... Going in that direction. Anyway, here's the infrared stuff, and we're done with the data sheet. Okay, so we're looking at this B and or C style configuration. Now, for this rig, I'm going to use one of these smart boards. They make these, um, you know, breakaway boards here with, you know, adapters for various kinds of surface mount and stuff like that. So you got little chips and big chips. And they come with some uh, header pins and things so you can make your own adapters, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put this thing on this board. Now, this board actually has more uh, pins on it or paces than the chip has legs. But it otherwise fits on here okay. So I'm going to put it on here and not use all the pins. If I can get it to sit right. There you go. Now, these smart boards, I should probably do a detailed analysis of these at some point. The way these are set up, they, they do try to make soldering really easy. Each of these pads in here, as I understand it, are pre-soldered, if I remember. No special skills required. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, there's a picture here that shows there's little troughs. 
and what happens is the, the, the chip leads set down in these troughs. So if I grab this and I move it back and forth, you'll notice the chip is not sliding back and forth on the board. Once you get it aligned right, it sets down in the board. And these troughs, I think, are supposed to be pre-loaded with just a little bit of solder. And the idea is you can take your iron and kind of smush the solder back and forth in there and get the thing soldered in. I normally don't do that. I'll just throw some more solder on it. But... Maybe we can go ahead and try their way here. Now, I don't expect it to work at all if I don't add some flux to this thing, which is weird. It requires that you have a soldering iron tin with a pitch smaller than the pitch of the component and your soldering temperature at least 750. You'll also need some flux. Okay, well, that makes sense. I don't know if this tip is small enough. In fact, it's not. But I think I can hit it with just the edge corner of that. I'm going to cheat. We got to be at 750 Fahrenheit, it says. huh? So what is that in Celsius? It's almost 400 C. So I have to heat up my iron a little bit. And that beep says it's ready. Now, the reason it needs to be that hot most likely is probably because this has, um, I'm sure it has uh, rose solder in it, which tends to require a little more heat. Let's see what happens here. I'm going to use SMD 491 for lead and lead free applications. Ooh, rose, big exclamation point. Rose! <laughs> I'm going to try this super tiny pointy tip that it came with. Quite often I'll use this thing, which spews an awful lot out. I don't have very... This, I think, is the only one that I have. It's the only little teeny tiny tip like that I got. This is breaking into a lot of new territory for me today. So you put this plunger in here like so. Now this won't hurt a bit. You don't need a lot of flux, is my point. A little stream like that is probably what we want. The goal, though, is to get enough flux on there. Uh, if you have too much, that's okay. If you ever have too little, it is never okay. You must have some on there. You can always clean it up later. It's just, you know, the more mess you create, the more work it is to clean it up. But too little flux is too little flux. You always need some on there. Now I'm going to get it seated in there. I'm going to mush it around because the flux is all over the place. All right, so that should work. Let's make real sure I got pin one right. All right, so there you go. There's a close-up here. You can see that uh, this chip has fewer pins than the breakout board. Uh, it's an 18-pin board with a 16-pin part. Uh, I'm going to seat it on the bottom like this. And when I put these pins on, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to put the pin on the front hole here to really reinforce if i mess messing around with this with tired eyes or something that I don't have off by one when it comes to these pins. I'm sure they had a 16-pin board when I bought it, but I must have used it for something else. So this is what I got. This is what I'm going to go with here. This is it for today. All right, so as advertised, let's see if it'll... The pre-soldered stuff will work. You're supposed to put the iron in the trough. You can see the iron in there. Some solder going, and you go like that, and it's supposed to solder the pin on. Let's see what happens here. Now, I usually do kitty corner pins to get the part seated. Before I do anything else, am I doing it by hand? It moved awfully easily there. You know, it might be that, you know, oh, you need a finer tip. I'm not buying that. Here we go. It does, I can feel the iron fall into the trough when it's in there. Let's give it a little push. That looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that is going to be just fine and ducky. Well, let's do the other ones now. Sort of see it. It really doesn't feel like there's enough solder in there, but 
Maybe I've just been overly soldering everything I've ever done. <laughs> That's very possible. Just I'm not feeling the, the the amount of solder in there. I don't think I'm getting a real fillet out of it. I don't know. Well, let's find out if no special skills are required here. <laughs> It's special skills day. Now, at first glance, the, it looks like the fillets are really nice. However, you can never really tell until you've removed all of the flux, because those could be flux fillets. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a little alcohol wipe here. and find out just how smart the smart boards are. And sometimes I can kind of see close with the magnifying glass and the and the desktop camera, but the focus is going to go nuts here. That looks very good to me. I'm very happy with it. Now let's go ahead and put the pins on. Remember that the uh, pin one here on the on the board is not used, so that first hole I'm going to skip. Put this in like so. I think I can just kind of thumbnail it and break it really easy. These are really cheap headers. These are not the ones that came with the smart board. So if these things freak out and the headers fail for some reason, do not blame smart board. It's because I don't want to fish the other ones out of the bag. <laughs> I'm lazy, and I've got a bunch of these lying all over. In fact, the one that I just stuck in there is a no-name generic one I got on Amazon. I got like a hundred of these things for like six bucks or something. So they may not be the best, highest quality. Now, I'm not a big fan of these tiny little boards anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and stick the whole thing in here and solder it. Oh, when it's stuck in here so it'll hold the headers. Where they're supposed to be and it'll also hold them straight because some i mean i've done this we've all done it you get done and the next thing you know it's on an angle like that and you gotta heat the whole thing up to get the thing out again it's embarrassing you almost want to burn it and throw it away and hide it from everybody certainly don't do that while you're on youtube okay <laughs> so let's not screw this up let's go ahead and stick it in here if you do this you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do that either. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, here we go. Pry this thing out. And I've said this on my channel before. Don't use your hand and then pull on it because you're invariably going to rock it and then you're going to bend all the pins on weird angles. I always pry these things out until they're super duper loose and you're not yanking on them and then bending them up, blah, blah, blah. Some of you are probably sick and tired of hearing that same advice, but it's true. Is a Raspberry Pi right up there with bent pins because someone is a dingus. I won't say who this someone is. <laughs> we all get lazy. Don't do it. Seriously, about one out of every five or six times I do it by hand, I bend them. And yet I still try. I strive. I believe that someday I will achieve perfection. Until then, it's probably a good idea to pry them out with a screwdriver first. <laughs> now, I think I've said this too. Make sure it's seated correctly before you solder them all in, or they're all going to be a giant pain in the butt later on to redo. Job there. There we go. And now I'm going to pry it out and bend it on my first try. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I think that looks pretty good. Now, if we do a search for the pinout on a USB B connector, we see quite a few things. Here's a nice diagram. What have we got here? Yeah, it looks like madadi.com is our friend. What do we got here? There you go. Okay, so, and they got a nice picture. Here's the cable. Here's the connector. 
I prefer these are if they made it an oblique projection or something on a bit of an angle, it would really drive home what you're looking at. But this is very well labeled, and I believe this is correct. We got pins one, two, three, and four. Pin one is five volts, two is D minus, three is D plus right there, and ground on pin four. Now, the way that the pinouts work on these things is that pin one is over here, pin two is this corner, pin three is down there, and pin four is over here. So the pin four on the bottom here, if we turn it around slowly, is this wire right here. So what I'm going to do with my Sharpie is I'm going to just put four bands on it. One, two, three... And four over here. It'd be nice if they went all the way around, but it's easier to do it like this, okay? So now I have four marks on pin four, and so on for the rest. All right, so there you have the four wires there, and the other ends are all marked. I'm not going to solder these on or anything because this wire is really kind of brittle and it has a tendency to want to break off. And if that happens, I can just clean up the thing remove it and then restrip it and wrap it back on again if that's a problem so let's go ahead and plug this in i'm going to just stick this into my regular old linux box and check the voltages and stuff on these pins make sure it's all good so our usb goes pin one is hot and four is ground so let's see what happens now, normally, these wires are too small to fit into these breadboard holes, and it won't grab on. However, this is a pretty good quality one with good little springs inside there, and I've noticed <laughs> that's actually viable. Do not do this on the cheapo super discount ones, which I have several of. I'm not making fun of you. I mean, it, you know, when you want to buy 10 of them for a dollar a piece on Amazon... You can't do this because the, inside there, there's little spring grabbers that hold onto the wires. And the high quality boards are made with better metal and they grip tighter and everything else, they're higher quality all over the, across the board. And it can grab onto something as small as this. This is, I think, 28 gauge wire. Oh, 30 gauge, right? This, this Kynar wire. Now, I have just plugged it in, and I specifically plugged it into my PC rather than a, like a USB charger because a USB charger might want to just send out three amps or something like that. And, well, no. <laughs> if you do this on a, on a PC, and you know, normally I don't like to risk my, you know, $2,000 desktop or something like that, uh, but um, those have good short circuit protection and everything else on there. Current limiting, all sorts of stuff. So that's I'm going to use that for this particular project. And clearly we can see 5 volts coming out of there. So this, I, I got the right pins, 1 and 5. The other two pins on here are the USB data lines, which is a differential signal. And those go directly to the data in and out lines, or rather the, the D plus and minus lines, I should say, on the chip. I have definitely unplugged the other end of the cable now. I do not want to do this with a wire in the uh, with a voltage is hot. All right, so pin one on the USB is five volts, and that goes over here on the adapter chip. If I get it in the right hole, while the board will grab it, this is such flimsy wire, you know, at thirty gauge. It's hard to get keep it straight, so you can kind of finagle it in there a little bit. Make sure you get the right finesse on there. There you go. Pin one is ground. Boy, it's so small I can't even see the end of the wire. <laughs> All right, here we go. One and uh, 16. All right, so 16 has the single, and this one has the four markers on it here. Okay, I can see that clearly with the magnifying glass. Now, the data sheet says that you want to bypass the power. Just some point ones. Here we go. I'm going to be sloppy about it. This is a 
probably good enough for bench testing. And make sure that doesn't short out in any weird way. So that bypasses the main power and it also wants me to bypass another pin over here because it has an internal regulator. These chips internally might run at a different voltage like 3.3 .3 or something like that. And I'm run out of pins. That's annoying. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the power over here. Okay, and then I'll just put like a, a jumper on there and then I can put this capacitor to where it belongs here. Oops, this goes between ground and this pin. One, two, three, four. It actually has to go like that. Uh, this is ground. Why don't I put it on the right color so I don't keep forgetting? Oops. And generally, you want to keep your color codes. Otherwise, you're, you're probably going to... Um, I do, anyway. I'll screw it up otherwise. You get a box of these nice wires. I honestly think I got this box of these wires at All Electronics as well, but it could have been like 15 years ago. I have since bought these in a box of jumper wires kind of sets on, you know, I don't know, Amazon or whatever. Since then, and they tend to be smaller, thinner gauge, which is incredibly annoying, as you just saw. All the way up to like 30 gauge with these Kynar wire or whatever this is. I just always called it wire wrap wire, that, the other stuff. Uh, it gets flimsy and it's difficult to get it to sit into the holes correctly. Nothing but frustration. Mm, like this, I can't get it to reach. But I'm in a little bit of an angle. Well, I don't know why they don't align these holes up here with the ones in there. I mean, what is it, training day, the idiot that laid these things out? Some manufacturers have them lined up, some don't. This is the good springs, but the bad lineup. I, yeah, whatever, you can't have everything you want. All right, now I got power. I got the ground. I got the two bypass caps in there. Now, the data sheet suggests we put a 10 microfarad around here as well. I'm not going to bother. I'm living on the edge, baby. I'm going to assume it'll run well enough. If it doesn't, I'll add the capacitor later. But just for hacking, just a sanity check, what I want to do is power this thing up and see my Linux recognize that there's a serial adapter out there. That's the minimum test that I want to pass before we go any further. So to recount the pins, I got pin 1 is ground, 2, 3, 4 is the V3 pin, 5 is D+, plus, and 6 is D-. minus. Now on the USB... Pin 2 is minus, so that means skip a hole and go over here. Whoa. Again, we're not powered up, I hope. Double checking over my shoulder. Goes in there. Hmm. By reason of elimination, this must go here. This is so sloppy, and I've stripped off so much wire. These could all short out and become really troublesome. Be, more, be careful if you can do it this way, all right? I won't say do as I say, do as I do. Uh, I won't say do as I say, not as I do. You probably want to do that if it's your first try, or if you're going to cry if you blow the thing up in your face. This, is, you know... If I bump this, this could short out and do crazy things. So, uh, really quick sanity check. I see two markings here. So, pin two on the USB is on pin one, two, three, four, five, six of the adapter. So, in theory, I should be able to just fire it up and see it be recognized. On Linux, you can just type in DMESG, and that displays the messages or dumps the messages that the uh, operating system logs over the course of time. So if you plug in and remove USB devices, it'll say, hey, I found one, and here it is. For example, the other day I plugged in my HP ScanJet to scan some tax documents and things, I guess. And here's a tablet so I could sign a document and so on. All right, so let's go ahead and plug in our new USB adapter and see what happens.
Now, I always like to do a, a D message before I plug it in and then another one after so I can see what changed. And lo and behold, it sees a CH something now attached at USB 0. Oh, well, there you go. Dev TTY star. Uh, a lot of TTYs, but there is the USB 0. I suppose we could run something like Minicom at this point and things like that and see if it squawks by hooking it up to the scope. Why not? Why? Because I can't type. <laughs> so hopefully at 115.2.8 none one, why don't I throw my scope on the on the on the receive data line and see if I you know hit the space, hold down a key and see if it repeats on the scope. So I want to see pins two and three on my scope. Notice now I don't even really need to see pin three. I really only need to see two because two is transmit. And that's really what I want to see coming out of this thing when I hit keys on Minicom. Now if I set my scope to capture me pressing the space key, there you go. That doesn't look bad. Now, if I turn on the decode mode on my oscilloscope and set the baud rate to match Minicom, I can actually get the scope to tell me what keys I'm pressing. So a space is a hex 20. And we can see it's working quite nicely. If we zoom way in on the start bit, we can see that <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> it looks like it's right to me. And of course, if I send the capital A, we do see capital A is a hex 41. So on the way out the door, let's go ahead and add a jumper here between the transmit and the receive serial signals on our adapter and create what we call a loopback interface. So everything we send out will come right back and we'll be able to see it print on our terminal. All right, so here we are. We type on the screen, and we see characters coming back at us. Let's see what happens. Should be able to, like, copy and paste it. Woohoo! And, well, that's, that's, that's tessellating perfectly. Let's do this. There you go. Can you see that kind of scrolling up? Yes, of course you can. All right, so this is working. It sends data, receives data. All is well so far. <laughs> So, all right, so we know we can power it up. We know the USB interface works. We know the send and the receive, and the TXD, RXD are working. It's at least running at 115.2 in what is called a three-wire interface. Because normally between two separate machines, an RS-232, you have a ground line. So the transmit received and the ground combined is usually called a three-wire RS-232 interface. So some other time we'll have to sit down and talk about the rest of the signals in there, the clear to send, request to send, and so on, in what's called a five-wire or even uh, more complex interface between a, uh, two systems that use RS-232 to communicate. But in the simplest mode, the most basic test case, it looks at the CH340C works quite nicely at 115.2. If you have any experience with this thing, please share them with the rest of us in the in the comments below this video, because I'd like to try and use one of these on a project. And if there's any gotchas that you know require a little more testing than just trying it out like I did today, I'd like to know uh, what you think. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.